We also have um, joining us here tonight uh, Simon May, PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago, Professor John Kelly, and Professor Marshall Solins, also of the same department. So I've asked each one of them just to say a few short words, five minutes or so, and then we'll open up for discussion of panelists with each other and also with the audience. And we'll have a couple of students uh, running around. There's one in the back, that's not a student, but a couple of people running around with microphones. So um, just raise your hand when the time comes and the microphone will come to you. So I'm going to ask, actually, um, Simon, if you would start. Sure. Uh, OK. Hello? Is this on? Can people hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so knowing that I was going to be on a panel with John and Marshall, I was pretty safe to assume that some uh, fairly well thought out ethical and moral uh, concerns were going to be voiced. So I thought I'd better do something a little bit different. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about death. I've always wanted to open with that one. More specifically, I'm going to talk about stories about death. I'm going to, for a moment, step outside the arguments about the moral and ethical problems presented by the human terrain system, and focus instead on the question of genre, and on the extent to which the film we just watched, watched both presents and participates in a particular genre, that of stories about martyrdom. Martyrdom, or sacrifice more generally, sacralizes. It consecrates a profane character by establishing communication between sacred and profane worlds. It expiates through the spectacular and theatrical fulfillment of an obligation to a sacred entity. Sacrifice is a foundational social act that brings individuals into a relationship with something greater than themselves. Well, military sacrifice also sacralizes. Or to be more exact, stories about military sacrifice also sacralize. They sacralize the nation state. Dying on behalf of a nation state both sacralizes that nation state and establishes the sacrificial victim as a particularly privileged subject. A dead one, no doubt, but a particularly valued one nonetheless. I would like to reflect then on the ways in which the death in a combat zone of even an avowed internationalist and critically self-aware academic like Michael Batia uh, comes to be represented through the medal, the memorial, and the obituary as a story of martyrdom, a story of sacrifice which sacralizes nation-state power irrespective of the particularities of its individual subject. Fundamentally, the complexities of Michael's character and the ambiguities of his opinion about the human terrain project are, to some degree, erased by the genre through which the story of his death is told. I'm speaking here more generally about the way his death was framed by the military and the public media, and somewhat um, about how the, the, the story of his death was told in this movie. The framed photos and dog tags of the memorial at the military base, the rifle shots fired over the coffins, the posthumously presented medal, all these things function to reify Michael Batia's death as a sacrifice, one that sacralizes not just his mission, but also that power on, behalf, um, on whose behalf that mission was being carried out. His death is made to retrospectively sacralize his work and the nation state by being told as if it were a story of martyrdom. <coughs> and now I'd like to read you a few quotes from Michael Batia's um, obituary and from the obituary of another academic killed while deployed as part of the human terrain team, Nicole Subegas. Both come from the blog Danger Room, which is part of, part of Wired magazine. Its obituary of Subegas, a political scientist killed in Iraq, and the second academic killed as part of HTS, contains the following paragraph. The human terrain system placed researchers into combat units in an attempt to lower the levels of violence in their districts. Instead, these two social scientists have become its victims. Critics of the project claim that the researchers might help the US military in its war zone targeting. Instead, it's the social scientists themselves who have been killed. Ironically, these civilian academics in their attempt to promote, promote cultural understanding are spending more time outside the protective walls of the military enclaves than many soldiers." End quote. So notice the heavy irony throughout this paragraph. They were trying to help lower levels of violence, but they became victims to it. They sought to promote cultural awareness, but they find themselves in more danger than the combat soldiers. They were criticized for helping targeting, but they themselves became the targets. 
Selfless sacrifice on behalf of the mission is more or less explicit in this obituary. But what remains implicit is the selfless sacrifice on behalf of that entity which commissioned the mission, U.S. nation state. And this is the last paragraph from Michael Batia's obituary from the same source. The human terrain system is a program we've discussed at some length here on Danger Room. Most of the discussions about the nascent program have been theoretical. Regardless of that wider debate, Michael's death drives home the personal risks and sacrifice of the social scientists working in war zones. And so I'd like us to reflect on the political and rhetorical labor that not just the reports that the human terrain academics produce in the field, but also that the reports of their own deaths are made to perform. And further, I'd like us to reflect on the extent to which stories about martyrdom often seek to foreclose upon certain critiques and debates. When something is sacralized through the shedding of blood, it is often hard to criticize. Thank you. Actually, Marshall. Oh, Marshall Yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about, uh, can you hear me? I want to talk about uh, the delusional nature of the human train project as anthropology. Uh, if I had time, I would uh, talk uh, uh, in one sense about the fact that they are fighting a war which uh, has no relationship to what's actually going on, which is a kind of state of nature created by the dissolution of the social contract of the Ameri <coughs> by the American intervention, uh, and in which uh, the government itself is a partisan factor, faction, or rather 27 different ministries, each with their own armed force, including the Ministry of Interior, which had 100,000 men at one point under arms. And uh, among the other targets was the Ministry of Education. <laughs> so uh, to call this an, uh, an insurgency and a war of, uh, of support of a government is a, is a total mistake, which I'm not going to talk much about right now, but I could come back to. What I want to talk about is the kind of anthropology that's prescribed in the counterinsurgency manual, uh, which is the most elaborate discussion of uh, what you need to know about the cultures of the people that you're <coughs> dealing with. What the manual prescribes is that military staffs, and in some measure, personnel at all echelons, must understand the people. To understand the people, they need analytic knowledge of what the manual calls six sociocultural factors. Society, social structure, you can already see the incoherence. Culture, language, power, and authority, power and authority, sorry, and institutions. To understand the social structure, they will have to know the existing groups, institutions, organizations and networks. I'm just, I'm just uh, paraphrasing the manual. Groups are defined as two or more people who interact on the basis of shared expectations of behavior and have interrelated statuses and roles. You can hear this sort of you know, 1950s sociology. To identify relevant groups inside and outside the area of, of operations, the commanders of combat units should be supplied with information on formal relations between groups, informal relations between groups, divisions and cleavages within groups, and cross-cutting ties between groups. Then, after similar mapping of institutions, this is a terrain, huh? organizations and networks, the military staff should, quote, identify and analyze the cultures of the society as a whole and each major group within the society, unquote. This minor research proposal includes inquiry into how the world is categorized, as well as, I'm simply reading off the manual, prevailing values, beliefs, which have <coughs> many different kinds, core, intermediate, and peripheral beliefs, attitudes, perceptions, identities, norms, codes of behavior, rituals, symbols, ceremonies, myths, narratives, taboos, and something called cultural forms, 
which are, quote, concrete expressions of belief systems. And then having mastered the social structure and the culture, I'm not sure what happened to the society rubric, quote, staffs must determine how power is apportioned and used within a society, end quote. No need to go into the other imaginary research agendas, such as learning the local languages and the people's interests. The fact is that it would take many anthropologists with many years of training and even more years of fieldwork to do all this, by which time pretty much everything would be different, especially at the tactically relevant level of appearances. Among the other things the military intelligentsia don't understand about anthropology is that is that it is the only discipline, apart from high energy physics, that is committed to the study of disappearing objects, which has been <laughs> right from the beginning. Moreover, being operational, much of this cultural knowledge has to be acquired by low level combat forces. Exactly how much and what kinds, the manual does not specify, but presumably enough to engage and manipulate the people for better or worse. Given the already demonstrated ineptitude of certain human range specialists, who as a rule have no in-country experience, the soldiers' instructors are also often mediocre. The new counterinsurgency doctrine turns out to be a hopelessly disorganized course in introductory anthropology, offered by inept professors to academically challenged students in a combat zone who will presumably ace the multiple choice final exam by guessing at the right answers and shooting the alternatives. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I know that you're anxious to get to the, uh, your own questions and your questions are gonna guide us to particular topics. So I will try to restrict myself to a few points uh, that haven't already been said. Um, there are, I want to raise issues about what's in the film and what's not in the film, and wh whether the issues connecting anthropology and the military primarily lie in the human terrain systems controversy, so-called, or somewhere else, all right? And the two issues do connect, because while this film, I was very happy to hear you all laugh after Marshall told the second joke, his second foray into humor, because I think Simon had some trouble there. The room is kind of under a spell, and it's a spell with a soundtrack of that movie, among other things. Now, that film has many strengths, and it deserves awards, but there's two problems with the film. One is that Brown University's Watson Institute was in the middle of making a film about human terrain teams when Michael Batia died, and the issue of responding to his death completely hijacked their project. And also, in any case, that was a relief because they didn't know really at the end of the day, at the end of the film, what they wanted to say about human terrain teams and the future of counterinsurgency and its relation to the academy. In other words, they could have left it with a much more of an open set of questions. These questions haven't gone away. Uh, I want to object to a couple of things in the film. The, uh, the film, while it has leading voices from anthropology in it, uh, Hugh Gusterson and, and Kathy Lutz and and uh, Roberto uh, <coughs> Gonzalez. It tends to present it as if there's a controversy, a point-counterpoint ongoing argument somewhere. The discipline is overwhelmingly against participating in human terrain teams. People with bizarre credentials get counted by the military as anthropologists or as social scientists for these teams because of their extraordinary difficulty recruiting anyone with qualifications to join. Now, Batia, uh, Mr. Batia, uh, had, did not have a PhD and was not an anthropologist, yet he was filling the role of an anthropologist in the human terrain team when he put himself in harm's way. I object above all in the film to connecting the label collateral damage to his death. His death is not collateral damage. He put himself in harm's way for we can decide whether it was noble or foolish good or evil, et cetera, et cetera. But he chose to undertake these risks that are the ironies that, that Simon is talking about. Now, I think a lot of guys at the Watson Institute feel very guilty about this, uh, as if he was the first ABD academic not to have employment. Uh, 
We, they don't mention the salary that he got for this. I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was in six figures and that that had something to do with his decision to join it as well as what role he was going to play. The film doesn't stint on showing us his practice contradicting his words. But it also, well, you'd have to, there's another film connected to it, a trip to Ticonderoga up the Hudson Valley where you see uh, Jarrett Chopra planning to have a, an annual event putting soil from various places around the world onto Michael Bhatia's grave as a kind of ritual of internationalism. You need to see that to fully understand the degree to which there's a politicizing of his death going on from uh, Jarrett Chopra especially, and also James Durdurian, to try to turn him into an internationalism <laughs> martyr. Okay? That's not collateral damage. All right. Number one, the U.S. Army is filled with people with way fewer options in life than any of the so-called anthropologists involved in it who choose not to take six-figure salaries and join uh, and find other ways to participate in uh, these issues. Number two, collateral damage should properly refer to people killed who are in Afghanistan, Pakistan, etc., who did not choose to put themselves in harm's way but find themselves at the other end of drone weapons and other weapons of destruction. Uh, and for us to make ourselves the victims is actually outrageous, whatever else you think is going on in these issues. And in the tone not of humor but of outrage, I want to finish very lightly in terms of time on a couple of other points. Quagmire, 2005, that sense, they only, the military only began its cultural turn on its Minerva project when it was stuck, all right? They, when they were metamorphosing a war on terror into a counterinsurgency operation and resurrecting doctrines that died for a very good reason and have a very short shelf life now. Uh, they're way past their half-life already out of sheer ineffectiveness. This doesn't work, counterinsurgency. So among the many reasons why anthropologists aren't involved is because of these intellectual dishonesties at so many levels. All right? But uh, other things are happening that are worth way more attention. What the role of academics and intellectuals is going to be in the definition and instrumentalization of responsibility to protect this Canadian project that began in 2005. That's another issue. I don't know if you'll want to talk about that or not, but I'll just mention it. The final thing I want to mention for reflection, the real epicenter of arrogance and ignorance in the story of human terrain systems is how much the US Army and the American public pays no attention to in the actual history of counterinsurgency deployments in Asia. China has been in Tibet since the 1950s. All right? India has been in Kashmir since the late 1940s. It's been in, in counterinsurgency occupation of Northeast India since the early 1950s. Burma has been run by a military army that essentially uh, counterinsurgency occupies more than 50% of itself since the early 1960s. The Asian highlands are nothing but a zone of military counterinsurgency projects that go on for decades. For anyone to call it a long war because we're at the 10th anniversary and be surprised at what happens when you launch one of these occupations in the Asian highlands, they're just not paying attention to readily available information. Uh, and it's the arrogance of thing, not only the state of nature turn that Marshall's talking about, but the arrogance of American policymakers that they don't learn from history. They develop a model that they wish to apply. Uh, they are very reality challenged, and I'm going to leave that as a more general theme than the, any one of these uh, in, uh, topics. The kinetic stuff they're excellent at, that's for sure, but they have trouble with reality. I'm going to leave it at that. Does anybody on the panel want to comment on before we open up? Yeah, um, so uh, my name is uh, Jeff Bristol, and uh, just a few little background to myself before I, before I make my comment. Um, I'm probably coming at this from the opposite side of many people in this room. I probably know less about anthropology than most people here do, but um, in September 11th, when that happened, I was uh, training at the Defense Language Institute as a Persian linguist. Um, so uh, I was in the Army from June of 2000 until June of 06, and since then I've kind of been on and off involved with, you know, the um, and I think the interest, most interesting thing about the human terrain system is that um, it was a miserable failure and it largely was consistent. 
Um, you know, the fears of targeting never produced any targeting information. Um, and actually, some of the military, some of the intelligence analysts were a little annoyed that it didn't, but honestly, it doesn't need to produce any targeting information because there are other organs of the military that do that far more effectively than anthropologists ever could. Um, part of the problem, uh, from what I saw, was kind of what's been brought up before by Professor Solomons and, 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 and in the film, um, that the military has this, and the government in general, I think it's largely probably due to bureaucratic ossification, has this kind of view of culture that there's a box that's like the pre-packaged culture box, and everybody gets it, you know, and every culture has it. And all the stuff inside is the same, it's just what you paint the outside that's different. So you know, if you say, well, Afghanistan has never been Iraq, the response is, well, of course it is. You know, there she is a Sunnis in Iraq who speak Arabic and Afghanistan, they're also reason they speak Persian and Pashto, period. Um, and you see that a lot. The last, last year I was working um, as a policy analyst in India, which is the National Ground Intelligence Center in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, you can say there's a reason I'm here rather than there right now. Um, and it was constantly this kind of very 1950s you know, model of social science. We have a counterinsurgency model. There's nothing wrong with the model. All we have to do is figure out where we're moving the parts around. And once we do that, we'll have everything perfect. Um, and it's and in what was coming out of the HTT, the, the, the material was largely um, elementary, it was a very good scholarship. Um, and a lot of what it was saying was running counter to what was standard policy within the United States government viewing Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, for example, um, the current military stance towards Afghanistan is that it's a tribal country where you have to engage with tribes and find and identify the leaders and, and then that kind of thing. Whereas a lot of the projects that are coming out of the HDT were questioning whether it was actually tribal society, whether some of this, you know, some of the approaches were valid or not. Um, and of course, that kind of ran against the current and so it got shut down. Um, and so, just a couple more points on the surrender of the microphone. Um, for your question, Professor Kelly, um, I was actually approached last year um, and this summer uh, to do HTT or HDT like things. One of them with Africa, which is Stuttgart, Germany. And so the pay is $90,000 a year in the United States, and I believe 160000 deployed forward. Um, and one point I wanted to make about um, Mr. May's uh, comments um, I, the sacrilege or sacralization of, 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 of death is definitely you know, a, a component in, in, in military ceremonies and that kind of thing. But the ceremonies that were shown in the film, um, the, the M16s and M4s with bayonets and the boots and the pictures and the um, 12 gun salute um, are all 18 gun salute are actually not generally done for public consumption. They are part mm -hmm. of the military's private rituals on their camps. You know the saying is that you know when you're in war, and, you know I know this from personal experience, you, know, you don't fight for your country, you fight for the guy next to you. And really that that those 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 ceremonies in the they showed the camp really were kind of brothers and sisters honoring all the brothers and sisters rather than something that's done for public performance. Can I respond to that yeah, first? Yeah. The, the, the I, I, precise, I, I definitely take your point that these are, are private rituals. And that's precisely my point is that um, there's always a negotiation between <coughs> this kind of public uh, performance of sacralization and then the quite private memorialization, right? And I think that's why um, in the Bush era there was such a kind of a, a conflict over releasing photos of coffins coming home draped in flags, right? Because at one level, the administration needs to get these images of heroic death out there. But at the other level, it really needs to control them because it can't be too close to the bone, right? It has to take a very particularly useful form. So I absolutely take your point that those, are, that those, are, that, that those were private, private rituals. I was talking more really about the kind of obituary stories, right? That kind of foreclose critique and debate by saying, irrespective of the debate about human terrain systems, these guys are out there putting themselves in harm's way. Can I also respond very quickly to another point you made, which is about the kind of old fashioned view of culture? One of the things that I think is very funny about the kind of self-discourse of human terrain <coughs> systems is this idea that this is somehow new, right? But this isn't new. Um, 
American doughboys going over to France got lessons about how to deal with the French. Um, American pilots flying in the Pacific in the Second World War were given handbooks that said, look, here is how to interact with the natives if you land in uh, the Solomon Islands. You know, phrase books, guides, ha hand signals, gestures, what to do, what not to do. Don't just walk into a village, you know, ask permission. So this idea of a kind of a commodification of cultural knowledge for military purposes has a long history, a really long history, just in the American military, which is why I think it's hilarious when people will talk about this as if this is something new. But you're quite right, it's a very old-fashioned, it basically hasn't moved on since then. I just take the little moderator's privilege too and say that in some ways it seems that the, you know, the, the very sad story of Michael Batia has hijacked the discussion in some ways as well. I mean, as John Absolutely. started to point out, right? I mean, his personal story versus the issue of, you know, what is the role of knowledge and of, you know, sort of, uh, if any, of anthropology mm -hmm. and all of this. Can we, uh, uh, Rick? Yeah. Um, No, we can hear you, but it's not up. <laughs> Perhaps I don't need it. Um, first, just a minor question for John. I, I, and then just a general question that it seems to me has not really been addressed significantly by the movie or the panel. Um, do you really think this deserves to be an award winning film? Because it struck me as anything but an award winning film. I thought it was generally boring. I thought that it it aimed at a kind of balance without ever really formulating a clear, specific question. It did get hijacked in exactly the way you described. And it used documentary techniques, which I would think any filmmaker would avoid, like all that boring stuff where we have to sit there watching them type out the messages. I mean, I'm stunned that this is a board movie. And I really, I'm wondering whether you really were being genuine when you said, I, you know, this really is a board movie. But, I don't well, see I, I guess I'd have to see what else okay, is up so for the, the jury film to consider. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, level some pretty I, serious criticisms yeah, I of the film. In this movie. But uh, I think doing a film on the human terrain system right, so in real time from how, its how launch to 2009. But, but with regard to the general issue, I yes. guess it seems to me that almost all the voices, whether it were the anthropologists you mentioned or others, seem to be suggesting that how one ought to feel about applied social science or applied anthropology specifically turns entirely on how you feel about the mission. And so if you agree with the mission, it's fine. And if you disagree with the mission, you hate it. So, and is that it? Is that the position that you would take? Or are you, are, or are you criticize, would you criticize applied anthropology in general? Or would you say, it's fine as long as it does the kind has a mission that I agree with politically or morally. Uh, I would think uh, offhand I criticize it in general. Uh, I don't know what other kinds of missions you have in mind, like I maybe mean, getting the Fox Indians their land or something. Uh, people work for corporations. They do things in the, in the commercial world. And we had a famous Princeton anthropologist who started by like, consulting firm in which did market research using anthropological Steve techniques Bart. to help people sell products. I mean, you know, people do that all the time. And, and the, I think that the, my perception is that the specialty of applied anthropology has its own set of difficulties with mainstream academic anthropology and the way it gets involved in these discussions because it sounds like a general critique of applied anthropology, and that's what's going on. Yeah, I, I, no, that's my, not what my, it is. My, and yeah. it's not, then it sounds like it's political. My reservation yeah. would be that, that the, the posing of an alternative goal, uh, which is usually commercial in these cases, is a, is a distortion and perversion of anthropology and, and produces a, a probably not very good results even for the people concerned. Well, I share the first part of your view. I don't know about the second, but the question is, should the American Anthropological Association be saying, here's the kind of work you can do because we, we think it's a, per or can't do because we think it's a perversion? Well, that is, that was at the time the center of the debate, which took the form and practice of whether we should return to the ethical code written at the, uh, pretty close to the, 
uh, we're just past the midpoint of the Vietnam War when a new ethical code was passed in the, in the AAA or whether we should merely revise the one that we had at present because the membership were unhappy with the report condemning the human terrain team's project because it didn't go far enough. And the problem in return to going even farther and returning to the Vietnam era code was that it seemed to banish, just what Rick Schroeder's talking about, it seemed to banish all applied anthropology working for a client as a perversion of a method which has as its goal, among other things, to be sympathetic to and to do no harm to the people you're working with. And the idea that you can't serve two masters if your goal is to understand and represent well the truth as seen by the people you're working with, you can't also be out to sell them toothpaste or to uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is, this is why it's difficult to give a simple answer to Rick's question. And when it came to actually advising the US military about this, I had no hesitation uh, to advise when Fonda Caro came to talk to me about it and when others did more than once that you, if you're going to do something like this, you're going to have to train your own specialists who use ethnographic methods according to whatever canons of ethics you can live with. Because this is so far from the, the, uh, the ethical goals we have in our relationships with the people we work with that there's no bridging this. There's no way of setting up the missions in such a fashion. Yes. The military have wholly other ethical dilemmas here, by the way, and if you don't mind, I'll tell you a brief story about them from the military side. They'd, I'd like to table the, the rest of how we evaluate applied anthropology because it is a complicated question. But the perversions are there every time you work with the two masters, where in the discipline we say we're not going to allow that to be called anthropology. That's a tricky professional question. The military are very angry. Uh, many uh, branches in the US Army at the human terrain system among other reasons for what happened in one of the other deaths in the system. And I'm sorry to say I don't remember the name of the, the uh, alleged social scientist who died. Uh, she had acid thrown on her face and she died two years later. And it was a deliberate, premeditated assault on her, taking advantage of the moment when the soldiers who were present to protect her and interrupt this attack were distracted. When the soldiers who attacked her when the soldiers were supposed to be protecting her found out that their election of their duty had caused her to have grave injuries, they took a man already in custody uh, in their hands, in securely in custody, and shot him in the head and killed him. Uh, the soldier who shot him in the head and killed him with deliberation was put on trial, found guilty of manslaughter, and sentenced to a fine and a suspended sentence in the United States. Right? Now, the military don't like this either. They don't like it that he did that. They don't like it that he was supposed to be guarding this defenseless anthropologist in the middle of a war zone. They think it distorts their mission, especially in light of what Jeff said about not getting good information out of it from a military point of view. So this isn't a one-sided ethical problem. They have rules of engagement that change all the time and are very complicated ethically and are things that military specialists work on the ethics of. Mixing these two is extraordinarily flammable. Questions back? Uh, uh, Serendipitously, I walk in here with a ready-made illustration of the pertinence of the discussion and also perhaps of imperviousness in other quarters of the university to the points being raised in the discussion. I just walked out 15 minutes, I came in 15 minutes late because I left four and a half an hour early an international relations seminar from a big hall, uh, which, is being, which, uh, which is being presented by an MIT political scientist, a former Chicago PhD, on the subject of counterinsurgency and social science. Hmm. He overall, he was based on a paper that he presented to some branch of the Navy, I don't know, it was a Naval Institute or something of that sort, but in any case, he was a paid, he was paid, he was paid research. And it's, oh, general, the general tenor of the story, the general thrust of the story was a story of Iraq and Anbar province in particular, and the story was basically the rise and rise, the creative, creative adaptation of a coin, and of the, and of the, uh, not the, the human race, but a coin overall to the challenges and the, uh, the, bizarre, the bizarre things that the, the, these peculiar people would do in response to American uh, 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 strategic brilliance uh, and, uh, and would eventually, eventually come up with a happy ending. I was the only person in that room, I mean, it went on for a while longer, but I was the only person in the room, this typically is the case, I'm in the crank in the department, uh, who raised any major questions about the entire presentation. But the gentleman also did say, as I, by the way, would be appreciated by a couple of people on the panel, is the following. 
He said that he, he had, one of his earlier works was, was called was on strategic emotion. I have not read the work, so I don't know what it means. So strategic emotion and conflict. He had presented the work uh, to a number of people in, I guess, Annapolis and other such places. And he was told by a, 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 an army lieutenant that who had returned from Iraq just a few months ago that they had read the book, imbibed it. That's a lesson for social scientists. Read the book, imbibed it, and that what it taught him was who to shoot in the face first when he entered the village. Mm. We still have a fair way to go in terms of spreading this kind of discussion. You come on, sir. address that last point that one of the issues that's come out in all of this work, I mean it's very interesting the values of the two communities in clash. The, one of the first things the anthropologists found out was how much plagiarism there was in FM 324, the, the field manual, which struck us as horrific and the military thought that was the funniest controversy they'd ever seen, that that mattered, that they were quoting course descriptions from MIT and other things in their various. Uh, the, uh, the military's taste in literature is fascinating. The David Galula, an old French uh, counterinsurgency expert in, who was uh, one of the architects of the miserable failure of counterinsurgency in Algeria for the French, is beloved of the military's counterinsurgency experts. Peter Parrott, who wrote a critique of it, uh, and a very astute one, is ignored. 
uh, by, their, by their writing. It doesn't serve the interests of the mission that they're promoting. This book, The Arab Mind, which was a kind of bombastic mm -hmm. treatise about the bizarre nature <coughs> of, of Arab obsessions, informed Abu Ghraib and other, Abu Ghraib and other practices. Whereas uh, uh, the film, The Battle for Al Algiers, is simultaneously shown by critics who use it to criticize counterinsurgency and by tacticians to get some tips. Uh, so it, it turns out that this is a, a field of, of extremely uneven circulation of information. Uh, there was an ethnography about Vietnam that turned out to be uh, tightly woven into the counterinsurgency aspects in Vietnam, and the author found out that his monograph was being used to identify and target the leaders in Montagnard communities to kill them. Uh, and uh, there was a, a deep then commitment for a while of like the need to disguise everyone from everything as if washing our hands of it is the solution, which is again one of the things that Rick's question points out. Let me just uh, interject my own question and then here's uh, not so much about you know, applied anthropology per se, but about a whole different kind of engagement and if we can't even speak to political scientists on our own campus, we have a pissed workshop over in the pick hall and this event over here, and there's you know, such a lack of um, exchange of perspectives. I wonder if in some ways there's a kind of fundamental failure of anthropology to educate, right? Because, I mean, those of us who are scholars, uh, we educate our students and so on, but that's a very small part of the possibilities. I mean, so that if we can have a kind of 1950s view of anthropology, which is, you know, not largely questioned except in academic circles and, you know, you know laugh about it, I wonder if, you know, we as a discipline ought to be doing more in terms of more, more public outreach and public education. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, uh, as, a, as the senior member of the panel, I can <laughs> complain. Uh, but I think the reason for that is that anthropology has no footing. I mean, that basically, uh, at least up until very recently, indeterminacy was the major conclusion of every stu study mm -hmm. because nobody, you know, the categories were too essentialist, the boundaries were too fixed. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, a period of uh, sort of uh, worshiping ignorance. Uh, if, you, if you say you couldn't, you can't do this, was the major conclusion of most <laughs> anthropology. So I think that anthropology was in a crisis, is probably still in a crisis, and it lost a lot of its uh, effectiveness when it abandoned a sort of comparative interest in cultures around the world. But that's, uh, I'm violating a precept of my own, which is that old people shouldn't, older people shouldn't talk about what younger people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> I think you paid your dues. So. Yeah, one in the back and then over on the side. Hi, uh, my name is Anna. I'm a second year undergraduate at uh, Bioweek. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about the history of Bioweek. I have a very background in this. Um, from what I understand, there are some very deep problems um, with the program and I've heard of like it in the past. Um, my question is what's the solution? Because it seems to me that the alternative that's presented is to send in an utterly ignorant military. Um, and you know whether or not you believe the military should have gone in in the first place, um, the fact of the matter is that we're there now. Um, and so if programs such as this um, have such repeated long history of failure, what do you do instead? I think it's obvious the solution is they shouldn't, they shouldn't go in. I mean, you, if you had the choice, of, again, of going to Iraq, well, what do you know now? Obviously, you shouldn't have gone in. I mean, from a, from a broader perspective, what, and this also gets back to Kathy's question and connects it to yours, uh, there's no doubt also uh, that, uh, that academics in general and anthropologists in particular tend to write books that are read by other anthropologists and taught in anthropology classes and that the circulation of information. Now the exceptions are interesting. Deborah Tannen in linguistics finally outsold Ruth Benedict as the best -selling, second best selling anthropologist ever. Uh, and, uh, uh, there are, and Arjuna Padara's concept of globalization and argument about cultural globalization has gone way beyond the discipline. It's in top five of citations in several academic fields and 
is in the popular culture. When you look at these, the filmic representations, it's always a joke. I mean, pen in one hand, gun in another kind of image. The idea that anthropology has anything to contribute is called into question. Now, in our responses, we can attempt public uh, encounters, and it's uh, advisable, I think, that we should, but I don't think we escape a primary duty to do the best we can in the venues we use. I teach courses on self-determination, on the political struggles of Highland Asia, on precisely what I gave you a one-minute version of. I've got a 30-hour version of underway in the classrooms with evidence behind it about the problem of modeling what's going on. Why is Asia filled with these alleged quagmires of counterinsurgency? How did these states constantly get swept into this? Why is the nation state failing there? I don't think the problem is in Asian culture. I think the problem is in the model of the nation state and that that critique involves serious intellectual heavy lifting against some of the most trusted values of our time that are running into trouble in reality. Now we have to work out what we really think about that. It's hard to criticize our most cherished values. Uh, and it, there's a reason why you, it works out slowly through seminars and discussions and the byplay among professionals. But that's the way we have to do it because the, what is to be done is a gigantic question. And we can start absolutely with Marshall's answer that the army shouldn't go in. But you'll notice that other armies are already in there and the other states are in trouble. It's a great exception to the peace of Pax Americana across that part of Asia. So there are serious problems and we do not have good diagrams of what's causing those problems. We haven't even noticed. I'd just like to, to kind of riff off something that John just said, which is that we do the best in the spheres that we have access to. From a pragmatic point of view, um, as a relatively younger anthropologist, um, we gray, often lament that, hair, that... With gray hair? With yeah, gray I know. Hair. I have more gray hair than John. <laughs> <laughs> Take my word for you at the back. I'm actually a little bit younger than John. <laughs> um, oh, wow. But as, as, as younger, uh, you know, uh, as a younger anthropologist, there's often a lot of frustration about what, say, the discipline has to contribute, but how little it gets out there, right? So on a practical level, things like uh, reforming the structure of academic publication, I think is absolutely vital, right? Uh, moving um, our publications away from journals that are locked away behind paywalls, that are accessible only to university students or, or staff, um, getting the things that we're writing and saying out there into the public sphere, I think is is practically something that's very important for changing a general discourse and maybe informing people about why they shouldn't just go in with the army. So the fact that there are still many questions should be thought of as a good thing because uh, we're going to uh, break now actually for our reception out in the lobby, but I know all of you who still have burning questions and comments um, can feel free to indulge them out there. And let's thank our panelists.